and move along. Okay, um, I have for Arts of the Week two more cathedrals. Um, some people have described it's, it's Leon, Leon Cathedral and Reims, which I am probably um, butchering the names. You guys can pass these around if you want to. They're very similar, although one of them is more ornate. Some people have described the Summa as a little like a cathedral, with all its parts going this way and that way, but all together as an integral whole to make this beautiful thing. Um, I feel like cathedrals, I mean, Neil and I were talking before you guys came in about, um, and Neil and Nathan too, uh, about the orderliness of Aquinas' thought. He's just divided everything up, every question. It's like, well, Yes or no? So we're left with this. It reminds me of Sherlock Holmes. Sorry. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes told Watson once that after you have eliminated everything that can't possibly be so, whatever is left must be the truth. Wait, is this the Adventures of Adventures or like what book? I don't remember which story. Okay. Yes, have... But in one in one of in one of the stories, Arthur Conan Doyle has Sherlock Holmes say that after you eliminate what can't be so. Whatever you're left with must be the truth, even if it seems improbable. And then the job, of course, is to find out how that can be the truth. And I feel like that's a little bit what Thomas Aquinas does. You know, he says, you know, like in last week, uh, is is God's existence self-evident? No. Is it provable? Yes. And does God exist? And so he's coming at every question in uh, multiple multiple ways. Now, today's reading was a little more of a hodgepodge because I asked you to go to different sections. Um, so it's not all addressing one question. But um, uh, so you don't, you don't really see the integrated whole. And even our short book doesn't put every, you know, it skips around a little bit too to, to try to find the ones that are a little more understandable for, for a beginner at this. Um, but I feel like last week we got that idea. And the reading I'm going to have you do for January, and by the way, we're not meeting till January 9th. So you have a whole week over a week after New Year's. I mean, technically, you don't have to do anything until after New Year's. And I'm not asking you to write anything. I'm just asking you to do one more remote reading, and then we will start the Divine Comedy the week after that. Um, the reading I'm having you do is more of an integral whole. In, in our reading for January, he asks, basically, where is our happiness? Which seems like a very important question. And he says, is it wealth? Is it power? Is it fame? Is it glory? And he systematically knocks out what it can't be to find where our happiness, our true happiness really lies. So you'll get a, a better sense again next time of that integrated whole. But let's just take our time. Let's talk about as much as we get talked about. Um, of the reading I had to do for this week. Um, I noticed myself um, in one of the footnotes, uh, this is a footnote to the prologue, uh, to this, this section. He says, Thomas Aquinas says, we purpose in this book the treat of whatever belongs to the Christian religion in such a way as may tend to the instruction of beginners. And Peter Craved has this footnote there. He says, it may shock the reader to discover that the Summa was designed for beginners, but it should encourage beginners to begin it. Here is how St. Thomas described his Summa. I think I told you the story last week. When explaining why he could not finish it. After he had had a mystical experience, the correct description is infused contemplation. I can write no more. Compared with what I have seen, all I have written seems to me a straw. He says, this is a little book for beginners who want to explore Christianity. And we met that same sentiment at the very beginning of our semester. St. Benedict said, it's just a little rule for beginners. Nothing harsh. Nothing too difficult. Those other crazy places where they read all the Psalms every day, do the best you can with the fasting rules, but you know, sometimes people 
people are sick and they just need a little meat. You need to feed people when they're sick. Take care of them. Take care of yourself. It's a little rule for beginners. And Aquinas is the same thing. A little introduction to scripture. And when he says the Summa, that's the 4,000 paper, right? Yeah. Not, not <laughs> this one. <laughs> not this one. <laughs> this is the. Or beginner book for begin. Yeah. This is the beginning, beginning book, I guess. Um, so the first question, the first article that he explores, is whether besides philosophy, any further doctrine is required. In other words, we have earthly philosophy. What does philosophy mean? What is philosophy? No, we can grasp, break up, to grasp what an object is or what what it is in it. Right. Yes, right? oh, yes, both, both of those, yes. So it means love of wisdom. And for Aristotle, wisdom, I think you can learn about this stuff here. Wisdom was knowing the causes of things, knowing where things come from. He said, you really, really know a thing well when you know what causes it. And, and I put the four causes on the board for you last week, if you remember. Uh, one cause of things is the material cause, what's it made out of? What is the efficient cause who made it? What is the formal cause, what shape does it have? And the final cause, what's it for? So, you know, a, a wagon, a little red wagon, is made of, I don't know, wood and metal and screws and things. Um, it's made by a wagon maker of some sort, either in a factory or your dad in the garage, you know, making you a little wagon. Um, Shaped, it's got a receptacle and usually has wheels and something to pull it with. And it's for, well, you know what it's for, it's for putting little kids in and dragging them around the yard. We all know what a wagon is for because we all know if you have younger siblings or younger people in your life, that's what you're going to do with the wagon. They're going to climb in and you're going to haul it until you're sick of it. And then that child will grow up and start hauling things, you know, stuff the animals are supposed to do. That's what they're for. So the causes of a wagon. So you can probably see that if we know that, we know a lot about wagons. Mm -hmm. Like who makes wagons, what are they made of, what shape are they, what are they used for? That's philosophy. And so if with our minds, with our reason, we can explore this, Aquinas is asking, do we need theology? Do we need anything except that? Or will that tell us about everything that is? Is that enough knowledge? We would, we would call it revelation, direct revelation from God. He doesn't say that, but that's what he's inching toward. Do we have to have certain truth to be real to for that? Or can we work on, can human reason work everything out? And because I had you cut right to the chase and read his answer, on the contrary, what is, where does he come down on this statement? What does he decide? Do we need anything else? Yes. He says, we absolutely do. Let me go to his, um, on the contrary. All, it is written, all scripture inspired of God is profitable to teach, to reprove, to correct, to instruct in justice. Now, scripture inspired of God is no part of philosophical science, which has been built up by human reason. Therefore, it is useful that besides philosophical science, there should be other knowledge. He's got a nice, neat, little, logical syllogism there. Um, scripture says it is useful for knowledge and teaching. Philosophy isn't part of Scripture. So we must need something besides philosophy for knowledge and teaching. Because Scripture itself says it's profitable for that. And he answers, it was necessary for man's salvation, that there should be a knowledge revealed by God besides philosophical science built up by human reason. And he gives two reasons to us in this section why we need God to tell us something directly. What is the first reason? If you were able to ferret mm -hmm. it out there. In his I answer that. Oh. Or on the contrary. Because man is directed to God as an end that 
have to grasp the reason. Okay, so if if God is our end, and by that he means final cause, right? Our goal in life is what we're directed towards. We need to know him. But we also talked about last week, according to already said, but we only know God in a very confused way. We know that there is one, but reason has taught people throughout throughout the millennium. There is a higher power of some sort. But does he like? Does he want? Does he have any relationship with me whatsoever? Or is he just sort of out there somewhere? I couldn't know that without God telling me. I am here. I love you. I have saved you. I couldn't know those things. I couldn't work out Jesus came to earth to die for me. It was just my reason. I love God. Does that make sense? That's pretty plain. And then he gives a second um, reason, too, why God needs to reveal things. And does anybody see the second reason? Well, to me it sounded like kind of the same as the first one, right? mm. that man is like, on a, but it said, like, uh, you know, the truth it, about God, such as reason, could discover would only be known by a few, and after a long time, a mixture with many errors. Right? Yeah. So, it, it, so it, it, they're related, aren't they? Mm-hmm. In the first case, he said, if whatever we can know of God by our own reason is, is, um, surpasses reason. Um, man is directed to God uh, to an end that surpasses his grasp. But we have to know him. We can know the thing that is our goal. Building on that, who could know? Let me start over here. Philosophy teaches us that there is a higher power. We didn't say that. But does everyone have the ability to work that out for himself or herself? Are all people intelligent enough or have the leisure to sit around all day pondering the existence of a supernatural being? We don't. Most people are busy making a living, fixing meals for their family, back in Thomas Aquinas this time, out literally in the field, working. We don't all have the time or the ability even to find out what we can find out. Now, let me read exactly what he says now. Let me read it in his words. It was necessary that man should be taught by divine revelation because the truth about God, such as reason could discover, would only be known by a few. And that after a long time, and with a mixture of many errors. If we left even the concept of there being a supernatural being, we just left it at that. Not everybody's going to even make it that far. We're not going to be able to make it that far. And it's going to be mixed with many errors. And sort of the history of philosophy, the history of theology, right? Paganism. It's the story of mixed with many errors. Well, we kind of know, yeah, there's something that moves everything else. Like Aristotle said last week, there's something that caused everything else. We sort of understand that. Aristotle came to these proofs after a lifetime spent thinking. Only a few people, and only after a very long time, are they even going to get that far and mix with New York. So Aquinas goes on to say, Whereas man's whole salvation, which is in God, depends upon knowledge of this truth. Everybody has to know, but he said not everybody has the ability to know in their own power. Even the stuff that we do have the ability to know. Therefore, in order that the salvation of men might be brought about more fitly and more surely, it was necessary that they should be taught divine truth by divine revelation. Aren't we happy to marry this time of year Jesus said, or God sent his son this is what we're thinking about right now he revealed himself in human beings 
because of this, because only a few could work it out. And only after a long time, and there's things they never, ever would have dreamed. Like the idea that God would actually become a human being. Would actually become a human being. And I say this every year, because I think it's astounding, and I think we forget permanently. Jesus is not, okay, this is not completely accurate, because time doesn't really apply to God, okay? But we're going to think of it in terms of time. Is the best I can do. Jesus is now forever not what he was before he was born in Bethlehem. He doesn't get rid of the body. He is forever a God man. He has the body forever. Not, it wasn't a temporary thing, just so it could die. Like he has it forever. He's for, his body is in heaven. Only man made things that exist for eternity in heaven. Do you remember? Mm-hmm. What was it? His permitted to be in the wounds. Oh, yes. We had this discussion last year. His body <laughs> stays forever. His body stays forever. And not in a million years, I don't think, would Aristotle or anybody come up with that. Well, that would say someday God is just going to take a human body and he's going to be bound to that body forever. And then I have to throw in one of the three persons of God. Like I would ever come up if with you, that on If you started thinking about that, every, everyone would have thought that he's crazy. Yeah. Those, those, yeah. Yeah. Those philosophers. No, and just like, I mean, his brothers did at one point. You know, his relatives said, he was a little wonky. They thought Jesus was, mm, you know, they came around. James, notably, came around big time and was a leader in the early church, but, you know, his own family. About Jesus. No. He doesn't laugh about you. <laughs> Jesus is the only one who's normal. Um, okay, so objection one. It seems that, besides philosophical science, we need no further knowledge, for man should not seek to know what is above reason. I actually am reading through the wisdom, the book of Sirach. And I just started, I just read this this morning. I thought, wait a minute, that's in today's thing. Seek not the things that are too high for thee. But whatever is not above reason is fully treated of in philosophical science. So we don't need anything. It's right there. Don't seek things too high for you. And so philosophy is not too high for me. Therefore, we need nothing else. Um, Reply. What is his reply? Mm-hmm. Good friend. Uh, like, yeah. if things can be revealed by God through faith in him to accept them. Like, what we should yes. accept it? Yes. He says, although those things which are beyond man's knowledge may be not be sought for by man through his reason. Wait. Seek, seek not things that are too high for thee. Seek them how? I'm just going to sit here and think really hard. I'm thinking, I'm working for it. No, good luck with that. <laughs> there are certain places you're never going to go. But as Addison said, but once they are revealed by God, they must be accepted by faith. And it is this, that, and this is a sacred place. Yeah, I, mean, I, I just asked, yeah. does it, didn't the person that was arguing against, <clears throat> against Revelation quoted scripture from that? I was like, this is a very good observation. Okay. okay. The guy just quoted scripture, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, but he didn't. He didn't say that scripture was incompatible with philosophy. So it's, it's not completely inappropriate for him to say. So you're just pointing directly at Revelation. Yeah, because it is okay. So let me take that quote. Seek not things that are too high for thee. That, that's not a newsflash. You know what I mean? I'm not disparaging scripture in any way, but much of the wisdom literature, you know, Proverbs and all that, is sort of stuff that we could observe. I hope that doesn't sound like I'm disparaging 
Proverbs or anything. I don't mean it anyway. But a lot of it are, is common sense observations. You know what I mean? Or things that all people agree we should do, like take care of your parents and you know that sort of thing, and, and honor authorities and stuff like that. Um, so, so parts the wisdom literature in scripture, a lot of it is not revealing celestial truth that I couldn't know any other way. A lot of them sound very much like even pagan, like Buddhists or something might say the same thing as some of those comments. Um, so, it, so he's quoting one of those. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but it is it is still hindering because how is truth been revealed to us in in scripture through the church, right? And um, and then so the thing that reveals it by saying it needs to be revealed. To um, okay, so there, there are only two objections here. Second objection, knowledge can be concerned only with being. Let me rephrase that for you. You can't know something if it doesn't exist. I kind of have an idea of mermaids and unicorns, you know, but I don't really know them. I don't really have any, any knowledge. I can't really do research on them. I just know some of the customary stories and have a mental image. So he, he said, real knowledge, real knowledge can be concerned only with being the stuff that is. For nothing can be known save what is true, and all that is, is true. If it exists, it's something I can know about, right? But everything that is, is treated of in philosophical science. Philosophers study Everything that exists. 